In the previous lecture, we talked about the problematic aspects of how to schedule processes and what the scheduler actually, um, what sort of problems the scheduler actually has to solve. Now, in this lecture video, we are going to look at some of the uh, textbook solutions to those problems. Let's begin by reviewing what the three main features or three main tasks of an operating system were. So while the operating system is a complex piece of software, at the same time it's a fundamental part of the computer architecture and uh, we take a very, very streamlined view of what an operating system actually is. And in practice, the operating system has those three main tasks or three main goals or three main uh, features that it aims to achieve. And those are the virtualization of resources, providing concurrency for different programs and providing persistence for storing data. And these are the three main things that we are going to discuss um, in the lecture videos. And right now we are discussing about virtualization. Also remember some of the problems related to multiprocessing and particularly the um, real world analogs of how things work uh, and it has specifically for uh, the dining philosopher's dilemma. So you rem remember this, uh, this problem I discussed last time about these uh, five philosophers who are eating around a round table, um, but they only have five forks. And for some odd reason, one philosopher requires two forks in order to eat. And the problem here is uh, what if too many philosophers are eating at the same time and uh, the philosophers who are not eating uh, cannot start eating because there are simply no not enough forks left on the table. These were some of the fundamental problems um, having to do with uh, multi-threaded programs or uh, multi-processing in general. They can be prevented by using something called atomic operations, locks and semaphores. Uh, those are some of the primitive building blocks that operating systems need to provide because the bottom line from last time was that the scheduler really does not care about any of this. The scheduler simply uh, schedules different processes, uh, puts one process on hold in order to serve uh, the next one or put the next one to be processed on the CPU. So the scheduler is simply a component that provides uh, parallelism, but um, it does not care about how to make the programs or processes that are being run parallelly uh, behave well. So we need some other primitive components to uh, ensure that that happens. So just to recap, um, concurrency basically means making multiple computer programs work uh, at the same time using shared resources. This problem can be divided into smaller sub problems but uh, one of the underlying issues to solve is how to make multi-threaded or uh, multiple programs work uh, parallelly in the first place and uh, hopefully so that parallelism is implemented in a, in a, a safe and, and good manner. And just to distinguish between two similar uh, concepts, concurrency uh, or multiprogramming refers to multiple different things done in the same, we're using the same processing resource, so multiple programs on one physical processor. Uh, parallelism as such uh, refers to having multiple concurrent processes which are being uh, run on using uh, different physical processors. So then we would talk about multiprocessing. So what we talk about here all the time is uh, concurrency and multiprogramming and not really 
parallel execution or, or multiprocessing. So it's good to keep this uh, distinction in mind, especially if you want to look up more information on the web. In any case, when we talk about multiprogramming, uh, running multiple processes uh, at the same time, what we talk about is the thread of an execution. So we have an independent program and its independent uh, fetch, decode, execute cycle. And what happens on this execution part of this cycle um, is basically uh, the whole process of machine instructions being loaded from the memory. Those instructions get executed by the CPU. Uh, the execution environment uh, environment's uh, instruction pointer yeah, increases by one and the processor fetches the next execution. That is basically the, the process of this uh, fetch execute cycle. And um, single processing would mean execution of one thread or one process at, a, at one time. Single processing would be the nicest way to solve all, all computing problems because, well, we cannot have problems with concurrency because there is no concurrency. In practice, this would be a really boring way to solve uh, the, this uh, com computing problem because, well, we have actually had recent examples of what it would mean in practice. So for instance, in the first uh, smartphones, first Android, first iPhones, you had to choose between listening to music on YouTube or doing something else at the same time time. So they, these platforms, these smartphone platforms didn't really support multiprocessing. I mean, did not really support uh, true multiprocessing. So certain applications could not be sent to the background and still expect it to work. So that's a practical example of, of why this problem is still relevant and why uh, we need to consider this when it comes to how an operating system works. In the PC operating system world, we have had multiprocessing for uh, decades now. So the first multiprocessing operating system probably was Multix. Um, then in the uh, 70s we ca uh, came, came Unix and, and um, afterwards Linux. Uh, IBM had its own OS2 operating system, and then in the 1990s with the Windows NT, Windows 2000, Windows XP came along. And uh, at the same time, Apple released their Mac OS X. So that's basically the brief history of, of um, multiprocessing in, in common operating systems. And the idea behind multiprocessing is basically uh, virtualizing the processor for the different application programs. So scheduling between processes from the program's perspective means making it look for all processes like they have their own physical CPU. So, so what we're actually doing here is virtualizing the processing platform, virtualizing the CPU. This uh, makes intuitively a lot of sense since, um, well, the programs do not actually have to uh, know about the uh, physical hardware that they are being run on. So it makes sense to just give them a an entire virtual CPU to play with. With this approach, there is also the problem of needing to get control back from the uh, application programs and their processes uh, back to the operating system. Uh, so what was it that triggers, triggers this uh, change of, of context of execution? Well, that was um, something called interrupts and interrupts could be based on a timer or it could be based on a process wanting to yield its, its turn on the CPU or it could be an IO interrupt. All of this was um, some, something we discussed the previous time. Um, the flip side of this is that we also need 
to get control back uh, from the processes to the operating system so we need some type of hardware timer to trigger these interrupts because while sometimes processes can yield voluntarily or there can be input output events that trigger an interrupt uh, these it's not we cannot take for granted that that happens and um, we do need some kind of hardware based timer and that is actually one of the only hardware constraints that operating systems uh, impose on a cpu design so um, all hardware processing platforms do need some kind of hardware clock uh, in order to provide a timer and a timer based interrupts on the previous lecture we also looked at a couple of um, analogs stories about multiprocessing and besides the dining philosophers which is a um, philosophical story there was the more tangible uh, milk crisis story so in the milk crisis story the idea is that we have two roommates who have agreed that if they're flat or if their fridge uh, runs out of milk one of them goes uh, to buy some more and uh, whoever notices that milk is running out needs to go to the store immediately and in this story of course um, person a goes to buy milk first uh, person b comes home while um, person a is in the store and also heads to the corner shop to buy some more milk and for some reason these people never meet up before uh, person b gets home and notices that they have suddenly for some reason too much milk and this is the premise of the of the milk crisis problem and while the milk crisis story is not very believable from a human perspective it's an analog to how processes share resources on a computing system so the nice thing about computers is that it's easy to think of from analogous real life situation that describes what is going on and the only difference here is the co that computers are dumb so if this milk story doesn't make much sense um, in the real world just remember it has to be uh, believable enough and on a computer system it suddenly starts to make more sense anyway the milk crisis story is a story about synchronization so synchronizing how different processes are take their turns on the cpu and in general these synchronization problems can be seen as uh, programs that fight two programs that fight over cpu time or in our real world analog it's two people who are trying to cooperate these are basically the same thing just they just happen at a different scale in order to talk properly about this problem we need a couple of definitions we need to define a few terms the first term we should discuss is something called an atomic operation an atomic operation is an operation that is defined on the cpu level and it's uh, an one single processing step that cannot be interrupted it could be something like uh, a simple addition of numbers or a boolean operation something like this uh, something that is primitive enough um, so that it's an actual physical processing step and it physically cannot be interrupted during this this one uh, machine instruction which cannot be int interrupted the cpu can't switch context and uh, it has to be completed so again for example we could be talking about load and store operations they at least need to be atomic what this has to do uh, with our problem well our second term uh, is synchronization so synchronization by definition means using atomic operations to ensure that different processes or um, threads in a program work uh, together in parallel.
Our third definition for the day is something called a mutual exclusion state or a mutual exclusion lock or mutex for short. Mutex refers to a state where one process uh, completely, completely blocks another one uh, when it is being executed. And uh, the other program's process can't proceed because the first one has locked some common resource they are both using, and therefore uh, only one program at a time can uh, proceed. So a mutex is basically a uh, operating system feature. Uh, we will come uh, back later to how locks are. Uh, how locks work, but it's basically a locking mechanism for some resource to try and prevent uh, problems such as the milk crisis from happening. The fourth uh, definition here is a critical block. A critical block um, basically means a critical block of code, which only one process at a time is allowed to execute. So a critical code block comes as a result of, mute, of a mutual exclusion state and a critical block of code and mutual exclusion are basically the same thing from just an, a different point of view. A mutual exclusion is the point of view from the scheduling or CPU side of things and critical code block is uh, the programmers or uh, programs source code view of, of how things are uh, working. Uh, the final definition in the slides here is a lock and a lock is a fairly simple concept since it's uh, also a real world concept. So a lock keeps one entity from doing something. A lock on a door keeps someone without a key uh, in entry to the building. A lock, uh, in computing terms, a lock is something you put into place before entering a critical block and manipulating some shared data or shared resource between processes. A lock is removed once a process has finished uh, whatever task it is, it is currently doing. And the question with, with locks is basically what to do if someone has put in a lock for a resource. Well, uh, the simple answer is you have to wait until the lock is removed to access the resource. And basically in all synchronization, the key to solve the problem is waiting. We need to wait until the resource comes, um, uh, becomes available again. And all of the funny interleaving or, uh, inter or shared resource problems are actually solvable by waiting. And we will look at how these uh, definitions, uh, how these terms uh, help in solving the milk crisis so that these uh, terms become a little easier to grasp. So if we start by defining um, some ground rules for what it is that we actually have want to achieve with the milk uh, crisis problem. So in this case, we probably would want to solve um, this the use of the shared resource, the fridge, and we could control it by locking the fridge door or putting a note on the on the door. So basically keeping anyone who who at least uh, comes to the fridge uh, entry to it. So uh, probably locking the entire fridge doesn't make sense. What if we something, wanted something else from there? Uh, but at least it would solve the synchronization problem and we would no longer have, have too much, much milk. So locking of course would be, or locks would of course be an easier solution. But probably the lock should be applied on the, on the actual resource, the milk, instead of the entire container, that is the fridge. You will remember that last time we looked at one solution to this problem and it turned out it wasn't a very good solution. So that, that solution was basically this uh, piece of code, which is a fairly simple if else, uh, well, to sequential if, if statements where first we check 
if uh, if there is any milk and then we check if our roommate is uh, has went to the shop to buy some more if there is no milk and um, if neither of these conditions were true then we would leave a note on the fridge door alerting our roommate and we would go on to uh, buy milk come back and remove this note from the from the fridge door now on the first glance this solution seems to be a working one well it would work in the real world probably um, this would be a good solution for humans but not a very good solution for computers this is the part where we need to remember what atomic operations are so basically uh, which of these uh, lines in the code are atomic and uh, basically well this would of course depend a little bit on the computer on the processor but we could guess that maybe each line in this code would would be somewhat atomic so this first if line we probably could guarantee that it is atomic it will this if if check will complete uh, then this following if line probably could could be also atomic and each of these actual steps leave note by milk remove note all of these probably are more or less atomic so we we can be sure that each of these actions once they are started they will get done without interruption of course each of these lines on their own are not problematic the problem is uh, when when we are uh, doing all of them uh, sequentially so meaning the context of execution can change between two processes at the worst possible time so imagine a context switch uh, let's say between um, these uh, a context switch somewhere here so between those two checks or a context which could happen uh, just after the the first two lines have been executed because again the scheduler really doesn't care about where your programs are in their execution cycle it can switch the uh, cpu's attention to some other process um, at any time so if you remember the discussion last um, time about why this this uh, solution is not a good one it's because it somehow makes the uh, problem even worse so we might have too much milk but only occasionally and uh, the problematic bit here is that um, everything could seem to work just fine except sometimes randomly issues might arise so if in the previous try our problem is that context of execution changes at the wrong time then maybe there is just something wrong with our code so what else could we do to try and solve this problem uh, so previously we almost got there the problem was that um, the context of execution could change uh, just after checking if there is a note on the door and uh, just after checking if there is milk and crucially just before actually buying milk um, so what if we do something about that what if we change the order of things in the code what if we first leave the note and then we uh, check the rest of the uh, conditions and eventually buy milk if there was none in the first place so this solution probably would work best in the real world uh, unfortunately though computer processes are kind of dumb and they do not uh, work similarly to humans with real world constraints so how this would probably work is uh, we start by leaving a note and let's say uh, our context of execution uh, um, let's process one execute this line of code and then the context changes then at the change of context uh, the, another process the roommate process gets to execute their first line of code and only then could we went back to this process and let's say it got to uh, execute a couple of lines before the other process and then they would uh, alternate to the end of their code uh, somehow.
maybe in maybe in this order or something. Um, so as you can probably see from um, the order of execution, how things will work here is that we first leave an, leave our node, uh, then our roommate comes in and also leaves a node on the fridge door. Uh, then the roommate sees that there is a note on the door. Uh, we see that there is a note, note on the door. There, therefore, neither of us actually goes out to buy milk. So here again, this is just to illustrate that context of execution really can change randomly between uh, lines of code and there is really nothing we can do about it. Uh, this is again, because like la last time we talked about, the scheduler really doesn't know about what is the context that the programs are in when the execution changes from one process to another. At this point, you might be thinking, hold on, why would one process or one person wait for a note that was written by someone else? Uh, can't they recognize their own handwriting or shouldn't they just sign the, the note that they have left? Well, that is again something that in real life would happen. Um, in the computing um, version of this story, there might be labeled uh, notes instead. So you might see the process actually signing or signing their note or otherwise recognizing which note or lock they have put into place. Um, the thing about this is, again, the context of execution can change at the wrong time. So let's say uh, process one starts the execution and, uh, and the context changes just after this first line. So therefore, uh, process one starts and then uh, process two uh, continues. And the problem with this is that if the context changes at the wrong time, um, as shown here, uh, both place their nodes and then they check if uh, the other process's node exists and uh, they go on and do not buy milk as a resource, uh, as a consequence, sorry. And this is actually, uh, this actually happens quite often in the world of processes. It's a phenomenon called starvation. And starvation is basically one more uh, definition here for uh, the situation where both processes try to reserve a resource and uh, as, a, as a consequence there is a clash, uh, the operating system does not know which one to, to give it to and uh, as a consequence then neither one gets it. Um, it is really unlikely that this happens uh, so it doesn't happen, it happens really a very small portion of the time, but when it does, it will happen at, at exactly the wrong time. What about one more solution? A bit more complicated uh, piece of code, uh, basically a few more lines where we have a um, loop where we wait for the other process or the other person to check if they are actually doing something at that moment. So the thinking behind this code here is that uh, we have processes A and B and we, let's say A leaves a node and then checks if, if uh, process B's node is there. And then we simply wait until uh, process B comes back um, and it's is back alive so that we can see what B is actually doing. And only and then and only then we finally check for this this uh, condition if there is milk. And if we are running out of milk, we eventually buy it if necessary. Uh, so that's what this this uh, while condition here actually does. Meanwhile, on the other side, uh, B uh, can leave their own node and check for process A's um, situation and get milk if necessary. And the key here is that uh, process A is waiting for uh, for whatever process B is doing. 
And if you follow this line of thought, then the idea is that A is, is taking uh, into account everything that B could possibly do. And if A waits for a long enough time, A can be sure that, that B has uh, come back from the shop. And if they have bought milk, uh, A has, has not um, checked if the, the milk condition or run off to the shop. Uh, the thing to remember to notice here is though that this process is not symmetric. The code is not same for A and B. So A and B are doing different things and this can be problematic. So the question with this solution is, um, does it work? Uh, yes, it does work because A waits long enough for B to do anything else possible. And if at the same time B knows that A is waiting, so B doesn't need to worry about anything. Probably what is problematic about this is that this is a very long and complicated solution to a very simple problem. It works, but it's really impractical. And the bigger problem is what if there were more uh, people involved in this or processes involved in this than just A and B? What if there was uh, three people, A, B and C? then we would have to modify this code uh, so that all of all everyone's um, actions were accounted for. And what is still a bit worse, um, A is actively waiting, meaning that while it's in execution, it's wasting CPU time. And also checking this, this wait condition wastes uh, computational resources as a consequence. The bottom line behind this story is that we can, of course, design better solutions. Uh, for that, we need better hardware or better firmware solutions with better primitive operations. Uh, so what, what I'm getting at here is what if we had a proper way to implement a lock mechanism? What if we had a CPU resource called a lock? Something like uh, this. Uh, so basically, we would have some kind of uh, lock mechanism or lock object, which uh, one process can uh, get to themselves if they uh, if they ask nicely. And then, and all, and this what this lock would do is then ensure that the CPU gives execution time to this process uh, for these cup two important lines, these that ha have to happen cons consequently. And afterwards, the process would then release this lock and uh, the scheduler would then place all other processes at the same level of priority again. So basically the question is, can, could we have some sort of primitive CPU mechanism where the processes could tell that they require the context of execution for themselves for the following couple of lines of code, because other, uh, otherwise their execution may not succeed if there is a change in the context. The code that is shown here, um, this lock.acquire and lock.release. Uh, these are completely um, figments of my imagination. This is not how it, uh, how it always looks. It's just an example. Uh, so basically the idea here is that um, we would have some method here uh, for acquiring a lock, which basically is a method that waits until uh, the lock is released and then reserves whatever resource it is tied to. Uh, the release method, on the other hand, releases the lock and wakes up everyone who is waiting. And that's uh, actually a uh, important consideration here. So uh, the lock may not always be available. So whoever wants to acquire the lock needs then needs uh, to wait until it is released again. Um, so processes who are waiting for this lock uh, 
do not have to actively monitor the lock state, but they get woken up later because um, this lock would send a signal to the waiters when it is released. Uh, locking mechanisms must be atomic. Uh, so we can't have a situation where two processes try to uh, acquire the same resource at the same time. This is at the heart of trying to um, prevent starvation which was the case in one of the examples we just looked at. A log would be uh, an almost universal solution to this milk crisis problem. Why it's almost universal is because now the number of people living in the flat is irrelevant. Therefore, this uh, solution would scale indefinitely. So if one or more people uh, try to access the milk lock only the first one gets granted access and the other ones have to wait. And what is good about this solution is that these critical two lines of code can be put between this acquire and release uh, method calls so that now we have much less code. So this solution looks a lot neater. It has many lines of code less. So now that we have looked at some of these um, synchronization problems um, in the real world, as in with buying milk, and we have looked at a solution to them, uh, the lock, um, let's briefly take an example of how this would affect a real world computer system. And this is just to drive the point of why we need these sort of mechanisms in the first place and what the operating system needs to do in order to keep uh, processes and programs from conflicting uh, with it from being in conflict with each other. So let's say, for example, we have a database system at a bank. This would be a software which either models a bank or controls the account and money of, of bank customers. So in this database, we have some customers, customers have accounts, customers can deposit or withdraw money. So the system will probably have different methods for depositing and withdrawing money. And then the amount of money gets updated into the database in this customer's uh, bank account record. Hopefully also in a way that the account doesn't accidentally get overdrawn. Let's look at, for example, the uh, how to deposit money. So let's say somewhere uh, deep in this uh, database or this bank system, there is a function called deposit, which uh, figures out what uh, account this deposit needs to happen and the amount by which the account need, needs to be uh, credited, credited for. This is basically just a one line uh, up, update to some database record. It's storing a value, making a deposit, uh, meaning there is one exactly one transaction and one thread of execution. Uh, deposits are independent of each other. Now, the problem with this is if the deposits are independent, it means that multiple deposits can occur at the same moment. So all of these uh, as, as such, the code how to de deposit money into a bank account, fine as such. But what if this happens uh, at the same time for multiple people? Um, let's see what, what this briefly, what this function actually does. All it does is um, get uh, an account identifier here. This is not very, uh, not very important how it does does that um, and then it just up updates the account balance to the database so it's basically just adding to the, uh, the this amount to the account balance so not a very complex uh, function so what could possibly go wrong when this happens multiple times simultaneously for many people um, at once so everything looks fine until we have two competing threads or two competing processes, two competing 
context of execution trying to perform the same operation at the same time. So let's say we have two customers depositing money at the same time. This probably would happen in an online bank, uh, two people depositing money at exactly the same moment. It's unlikely that this happens, um, but if there is many, many transactions, like in a real bank there would, the likelihood of coincidences grows. So therefore this could, could possibly happen. So let's look at these two parallel uh, threads of execution. Let's say we have uh, deposit one on the on the left hand side and deposit uh, and the second deposit deposit two on the uh, left hand side here. So what if these two uh, deposits were to happen at the exactly the same time? Now again, remember that because in, in computing resources have to share physical uh, CPU, CPUs, therefore the context of execution can change between two threads. So the context of execution can change between these two deposits at a random time. And let's take a look at what happens uh, in a, what is a, a pseudo machine code if the context of execution changes at exactly the wrong time. So this uh, thread on the or the process on the left hand side gets to load uh, the account balance into somewhere, some register where it stores an intermediate value. But then immediately if, if uh, the context of execution changes, we go to the next line, which is here in the next process. So we uh, load the same account balance into the same intermediary re register. Then we do the update on, on whatever the deposit was supposed to be. And if then context of execution changes again, we come back to this uh, first process and we add the amount of money from from the first deposit uh, to this register all over again. So now, um, because we have done this this operation, adding something to this intermediary register twice, the amount of money that we're going to be depositing into the bank account is of, is of course going to be incorrect. And this is just because the same the same function is being called by two different uh, threads of execution and we had no uh, way to ensure that this uh, sequence of operations was atomic. So in this example um, we had a system that needs to work in parallel for the users um, and therefore there might be some unintended consequences meaning the system might behave erratically and in this example that erratic behavior means that one of the deposits is is lost into um, what, what is basically the graveyard for for bits uh, from a bank's point of view this is slightly inconvenient or actually completely unacceptable um, Actually, the only time when a deposit is successful is when the depositing routine is completed in its full. So context of execution can uh, does not change between beginning the deposit routine and ending the deposit routine. Uh, so we should be able to execute all the instructions in their right order and context does not change. And for that, we would need some kind of locking mechanism. Okay, the bank example is one um, relatively easy to uh, ident identify with a real life example of synchronization. Um, another problem that we see often in the real world with real PC computers is a system that has multiple locks, uh, different locks in it. Uh, this more or less applies to all modern uh, operating systems. Uh, so we basically have a system with, 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 uh, which has multiple locks and all those multiple locks are needed, but they are used at different times by different processes. And in a system where there are more than just a handful of locks, 
uh, those logs, uh, it would make sense for those logs to have some kind of priority. So one log is, is more, uh, is higher up in the food chain than the other. For an, as an example of this, for example, in the Linux kernel, there exists a predefined prior list for uh, the order in which logs can be reserved. In practice, this kind of a system results in a um, mechanism where one lock is used to lock another lock. And how the system works is basically uh, to ensure that one process has all the resources it, it needs. And if it cannot uh, get all of the resources it needs, it doesn't get any of them and it keeps on waiting. And this is another way of avoiding starvation. At the end of all of this theory, um, there is only one question that remains, which is, can we even implement critical code blocks? Um, we would need some sort of hardware uh, atomic operations that cover multiple lines of high level code. On a hardware level, uh, yeah, this is perfectly doable. It's just a matter of how the CPU decodes uh, a machine instruction. And if the CPU is, is instructed to decode multiple um, machine instructions in a row, it will not be any, any wiser. So yes, on a hardware level, perfectly doable. Um, the thing to remember from this is logs do have to be implemented on the hardware level. Um, on the one hand, lock mechanisms can't be directly hardware mechanisms because for each locking action, we would need to move into kernel mode to access the hardware and then hardware calls through the kernel are very slow. On the other hand, uh, we can't put locks into the, uh, into the memory space of the processes called user mode either, because um, if we were to give a user mode uh, controls of the lock to the um, processes, then one process could reserve resources from all the others. And, you, and one single user, one single program could um, get the entire system into uh, an unresponsive state by reserving all hardware resources. Um, the way how this is realized in real processors is um, they have some specialized read, modify, write instructions. Uh, these are specialized machine instructions which bo uh, both read and write to a memory location at the same time and this time uh, atomically. So what this one um, atomic read, modify, write instruction does, it um, reads a value, modifies uh, that value and writes uh, the new result into some memory lo location all in the cycle of one machine instruction. This, it turns out, is in the end all we need to do to implement a lock. And we will get back to how this, this is actually implemented maybe later, but this is the theory behind how to uh, implement a lock. And if it is not uh, right now uh, obvious how it would be done, um, th you could think about um, how to uh, prevent one single uh, value in the memory uh, being uh, read and modified at the same time between two processes or two contexts of execution. Anyway, uh, the point of all this, the hardware platform is in charge of implementing these specialized uh, atomic instructions. Um, but the processes that run on the platform only see a programming interface. Uh, so if one process leaves a resource locked, uh, the CPU or the operating system can do something about it because locks are not based on changing the context of execution and multiple lines of critical code do not need to ex exist. Uh, just one primitive instruction will be enough. Something else to remember, a, a good lock usually um, is uh, functional, 
equitable and efficient. Uh, functionality here meaning the log needs to keep other processes from accessing it, its critical areas. Waiters are not allowed to mess with processes that are currently being executed. Equality here means all processes have the cha same chances of using a, a log, so all processes are um, equally likely to be able to acquire a log once they uh, once they try to reserve it. So waiters do not starve uh, while while waiting indefinitely. And efficiently basically means the log needs to be efficient. Uh, uh, we should aim to not waste processing time for the waiters. So the waiters should not be uh, busy waiting. The waiters uh, should go uh, into sleep and just be woken up by some, some signal coming from the scheduler or from the operating system. In the real world, there exists a couple of different ways to implement locks, uh, basically uh, in order to determine in which order should a lock be reserved by processes because in the real world oftentimes uh, multiple processes want to acquire the same lock at the same time. This can be done, done by simply queuing uh, first in first come, uh, first in first out. Uh, the systems can be ticket ba ba based, lottery based, uh, something called spin locks or uh, semaphores and these are all uh, different implementations for the same thing, thing how to ensure that everyone who wants to acquire a resource eventually get uh, that that resource and nobody starves to death while uh, waiting indefinitely finally what are the key takeaways from this lecture uh, so basically we covered two things and in very uh, detail with using very detailed real world analogs and those were uh, log implementations and the common problems of concurrency. So really what you should take away from this is why do logs exist, how could they be implemented and um, what kind of problems do they aim to solve.